So good evening, everyone. We are very happy to welcome Corinne Manog to give the 16th Osmoon lecture on the topic E8 and the standard model. Corinne is currently professor of physics at Oregon State University, and her research interests are in general relativity and mathematical physics. More recently, her work has focused on applications of the octonions to the theory of fundamental particles. Corinne obtained her PhD in 1984 from the University of Texas under the supervision of Bryce Devitt in the area of quantum field theory in curved space. Her dissertation was titled The Vacuum in the Presence of Electromagnetic Fields and Rotating Boundaries, and the thesis gave a treatment of the gravitational Casimir effect in rotating reference frames and a discussion of superradiance in both gravitational and electromagnetic contexts. Subsequently, Corinne has worked at Durham University, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Lancaster University, Adelaide University, and the Math Science Research Institute at Berkeley. Corinne's important works include a study of the rotating quantum vacuum, octonionic representations of Clifford algebras and triality, the exceptional Jordan eigenvalue problem, and particle physics with the group E6, amongst others. In addition to her ongoing work in mathematical physics, Corinne has made significant contributions in physics education. Since 1997, she has directed the Paradigms in Physics project, a complete restructuring of the underground physics major, undergraduate physics major, sorry. She's also co-author of a well-received and important book on the octonions released in 2015. Corinne was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2005 and was an inaugural fellow of the American Association of Physics Teachers in 2014. We are very happy to have you with us today, Corinne, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Tajinder, and Michael, who's not here, but this has been such a fascinating um, lecture series. I've been really, really enjoying being a part of it, and thank you for inviting me to contribute. Um, the work I Good. will be talking the work that I will be talking about today is joint work um, with Tevian Dre and Robert Wilson, I think both of whom are, are online. So um, I'm sure that they will stand to, to correct any of the errors that I make. This is a follow-up talk um, from the one that Tevian gave like six weeks ago. Um, and so I will give a very rapid review of that talk at the beginning of mine um, to sort of set the stage. He was talking about the mathematics of, of the E8 model um, that, that we were using. And now I'm going to try and talk about um, how to put some physics around it. Um, oh, wait a minute. So we have had um, funding from a, a variety of places uh, over the years. So this work goes back to my um, original postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study um, back in 1986 was the first time I started using the octonions to look at anything. At that time, we were trying to look at the superstring um, and to parameterize the superstring in terms of octonions. And if there's time at the end or maybe in the, in the question period, I can talk a little bit more about, um, about that work. Um, We've had a number of collaborators and mentors over the years, but in particular, I wanna highlight David Fairley and Tony Sudbury, who were the two people who really introduced me to the topic and um, when, back when I was a postdoc and really were, were strong mentors um, at that stage. Um, here is a list of um, our most recent work, which is what I'll really be talking about today including a new paper that should come out on the archive within a few days. Um, it's still in preparation um, about E7. Um, I'm going to go through these slides quickly because I know that things are recorded and um, you can go back and look at them, but here's a list of our earlier papers. I've tried to make also a short list of references 
um, that were most influential for us and but see complete references in our recent papers. And I also want to highlight that David Chester's talk two weeks ago was really very similar to this one in terms of the flavor of what he and his collaborators are attempting to do. And he gave such a marvelous sort of list of references and history of how the things put together were put together. So I will refer everyone to that recording as well. Okay, so let me start with a rapid review of, of Tevian's talk. So Tevian's talk was, um, was really about this new description of E8 that was really, it, it was uh, Rob Wilson who gave us the key to understanding this. So people, the, people had been working for a long time on the magic square, um, which <laughs> parameterizes various Lie algebras in terms of um, two octonians or um, octonians and maybe split octonians, uh, elements of the division algebras. So R, C, H, and O, and R prime, C prime, H prime, and O prime, where these are the split cases. Within this orange box, people knew how to write these, all of these elements of these Lie algebras, the generators, in terms of three by three matrices uh, with entries in these things, um, in these division algebras. But people didn't really know how to do the octonionic case in quite the same language. And it, and it was Rob who really helped us figure out how to do that. Um, and so the E8 paper that we uh, um, published recently with Rob as the first author shows how to think of these things as, I would call them generalized three by three matrices and a generalization of the commutator that really allows you to, to think about everything in that same model. So these three by three matrices, everything in it will have two labels, one from this division algebra and one from this division algebra. And Tevian's talk was really about the details of the mathematics of how and why that works. Um, but now that we, I, I'm really a physicist, and now that we know um, how that works. This is something that can be programmed into a computer and you can um, kind of mentally forget the details of that and just think of it as three by three matrices and commutators. Um, another part of what Tevian talked about is that there is a two by two version uh, of the magic square um, that has this, the same division algebra structures, but now you're thinking about two by two matrices and you'll notice that all of these entries in here are orthogonal Lie algebras with the signature determined by, in this case, I'm doing um, uh, a, a, a division algebra and a split division algebra. So the signature is determined by that. You can, there are also cases where you can do two uh, division algebras and two split cases. I'll be looking at today at this half split case. And a really important result about the relationship between the two by two magic square and the three by three magic square is that all the three by three magic square really does is add to these orthogonal algebras an appropriate set of spinners that are spinners of the, the um, orthogonal algebra um, with the, and you automatically get the appropriate bot periodicity for those spinners. So there's fundamentally in this structure that division of how the two by, the three by three things break up into two by twos and spinners. Um, I'll also point out that the two by two Lie algebras um, in, a, in a very general sense are all degree two in Clifford algebras. So for those, uh, a number of people who are in the audience who do Clifford algebra things, um, there is some Clifford algebra, at least degree two Clifford algebra 
uh, things going on here. And I'll have more to say about that uh, later. Um, I will be referring to, uh, I'm being a physicist, I like to pick an explicit basis to help me keep track of things. And therefore I want to label my octonians and my split octonians. So the next couple of slides are just to help you understand what my notation is. Um, so for the octonians, I will always use lowercase letters. The If I really need a preferred octonionic unit, I will call it uh, this script L, which is in the middle of the octonionic multiplication table. If I need a preferred quaternionic space, every line or circle in here can be thought of as a quaternionic space, but the preferred one I will talk about is IJK, is labeled IJK. Oops. For the split octonians, I will use uppercase letters, and then every unit that has a capital L in the label is a split thing. So L, all the L squareds are minus one instead of being plus one. Um, again, if I have a preferred one, I'll call it L, um, but uh, L, IL, JL, and KL are all the split units. If you want to use this um, diagram to give you the multiplication table, then anytime you're multiplying, for instance, an IL times a JL, you have to switch the sign that you would get from the arrow from the, uh, from the straight up octonionic multiplication table. Um, I will note that because L squared is equal to one, it's almost not there. And a lot of the early work we did, we didn't, we were, working in a case where we only had, of all of these units, we only had one of them. And we actually didn't know it was there. And that tripped us up for actually a couple of decades. But the important thing here is L squared is one, so it's almost not there. But its conjugate is minus L. And so, um, and, and that then become, that becomes important. I'll, I'll talk about it again later. I will also point out the fact that since K is a rotation-like label and KL is a boost-like label, that the combinations K plus and minus KL are null. So if I'm thinking about the uh, magic square labeled by a division algebra and a split division algebra, then I will, each element uh, in the magic square has to be labeled by one of these and one of these. And so these are the labels that, I, that I'll use. So if I'm in the R, R prime spot, one is the, um, is the unit element for the octonians and U is the unit element for the split octonians. And so those are the labels. When I go to the complexes, I'll add K. When I go to the quaternions, I'll add I and J. And when I go to the octonians, I'll add all of these labels. Similarly, going down, when I go to C prime, I'll add capital L and on down like this. So this is how the labels go. Um, a warning to the physicists in the group. Um, physicists really like to um, look at Hermitian operators because they have real eigenvalues. But that disrespects the fact that these operators really come initially from unitary operators. So for example, the time translation operator is e to the minus i the Hamiltonian times time over h bar. So this Hamiltonian is the thing that they want to be permission. But if you look at an infinitesimal transformation from here, it's really ih that is the thing. And so everything that you really care about really should be anti-hermission when you're in this Lie algebra land. 
So all of the rules of thumb that as a physicist, you might have memorized about which things are Hermitian and which things are anti-Hermitian, we're going to be working in the Lie algebra where of E8, where everything is anti-Hermitian. So you just have to um, give up on, on those old rules of thumb. And in particular, um, we can use capital L to turn things that look like they were Hermitian into anti-Hermitian things. Um, you also then need to think very carefully about, do you really need real eigenvalues? And do you need to complexify in the raising and lowering operators? Um, fundamental to the construction that, that Rob made is that the three by three matrices have a type structure. So everything in the yellow box here are the two by two things that would be give the orthogonal Lie algebras. And so, um, so you have will have some elements that will label with D for diagonal, and then X's, Y's, and Z's are just all the, the various off diagonal positions. But anything with a label X or D is in the orthogonal group. And the Y's and Z's are the spinner representations. Of course, the spinner representations also have these components down in the bottom row, but you can also very much think about this two by two matrix acting on this column. Um, and then the spinner will have more the feeling of a spinner to you. Um, in order to make all of these things um, anti-Hermitian, the Ds must have both labels in the same division algebra. Um, we've gotten in the habit of not always writing the one or U indices. So everything really should have two indices. But if we if you see something with a single index, it's just that we left out a one or a U. So now we need to make a Lie algebra, we need commutator rules. And so this is just a quick um, description. If you take something in the SO16 with something in the SO16, you either get zero or SO16, depending on the whether you have a label common to this SO16 and this SO16. If you take SO16 with a spinner, you get a spinner and two spinners put you back in SO16. And the important thing here is, I mean, this is just what you would expect, but the important thing here is that the rules on the labels is that if you take an SO16 on a spinner, um, the spinner that you get, you multiply apply the, the division algebra labels from the SO16 onto the spinner to get the labels on the new spinner. Um, I'm being a little bit loose with signs here. So exactly what you mean by multiplying, you have to be a little bit careful about up to sign, but it, um, you can keep track of which things are in which spaces really by watching the labels. So that's my summary of what Tevian did. Let me pause here and see if there are some uh, quick questions just about the, the notation that I'm going to use. Tajinder, are you monitoring the chat? Yes, yes. So, yeah, yes. There was a question from Hillary, which Tevian answered. So. Okay. No other questions? All right, so let's try and do some physics. So now what I wanna do is really tell you what the choices are that we're making for the model um, today. And of course, lots of other people in the audience have, are making different choices. And in particular, I will comment that Rob is now making some very different choices from these in terms of what it is that he's prioritizing. And he will be talking in November and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what he's coming up with by making some different choices. But these are the choices uh, for
for, for the, the couple of new papers that I've talked about and that I'm talking about today. So the first choice is that we're going to put everything, and I really mean everything we can, into a, a real E8. Um, today, I'm going to do the half split version. Um, but in particular, I'm not going to um, complexify. So the minimal representation of E8 is the adjoint. So both the actors and the actees are in the same space. Um, and I won't allow complexification and we'll have to pay very close attention then to the signature of this half split case. And the other constraint I'm going to put on the work that we do is that whenever we look at a subalgebra, I want it to be one which is in the magic square. And this puts lots of constraints on the kinds of things that that you can um, that you can pay attention to. I'm also going to prioritize Lorentz invariance and identifying weak and color over generation. I think one of the things that Garrett Lisi um, ran into trouble with um, years ago was that he was trying to put all of these things in and you just simply can't. It's not, it's not a big enough space. Um, and I'll have lots, I, lots to say about generation later on, but I really wanna put these, these Lie algebras in. And I'm explicitly not trying to put gravity in. Um, because this is a Lie algebra, it really is an algebraic structure. It doesn't have um, space-time and space-time derivatives in it. I suspect that the structure that we're uncovering is probably like the fibers in a fiber bundle over uh, a space-time. And the last thing that I want to do is that I want to allow the Clifford and Jordan algebra structures to emerge from E8, not to highlight them. Again, I know that there are um, a lot of people in the audience who are really prioritizing the Clifford algebras. Um, and I just want to see which Clifford algebras are in E8 um, and not the ones outside of it. Um, so the questions I have in mind for today is given that the set of choices I just talked about, how do these choices lead to interesting insights about the mathematical structures that are inside E8, and also how do these choices lead to interesting insights about the standard model and possible variations or modifications. So now that we have this um, basis for E8, we can play a game. And the game we're gonna play is you pick an entry in the magic square, you assign to it division algebra labels. And then you can, in that entry, you can decompose it into some smaller entries still in the magic square and the Lie algebra that centralizes it in the bigger, in the bigger Lie algebra. And then we will interpret the Ds and Xs as either small adjoints or the bosonic representations of those adjoints. So these are in the two by two part of the magic square. And we will interpret all of the Ys and Zs as the fermionic representations. So we're gonna take very seriously the split between the two by two magic square and the three by three magic square. And we won't violate that. And we'll always try and stay within the magic square. So as an example, let me start with the A5 here that's in the quaternion slot in the division algebra structure, and it's in the C prime slot in the split structure. So the labels that I will allow uh, myself to use are 1ijk, the quaternionic the preferred quaternionic units 
and U and L, which are my preferred um, split complex numbers. So these are the labels, and this is the Lie algebra that I'm looking at. It has 35 elements, and let's look at what those are explicitly. So if I look at the content of this, a, this particular A5, I notice that it has in the two by two structure, it, it is an SO5-1 with this set of labels, but there's also an adjoint SU2 in it. And because I'm in the quaternionic space, not I'm not yet using any octonionic units, I can think of all of the um, generators of this as three by three matrices with elements in with these labels. And so in particular, I have matrices that have a three three component that looks like I or J or K. And that is a basis for this adjoint SU2. When I write it in this way, I can see that the matrix multiplication is just going to make this I or J or K be a quaternionic right phase on the spinner reps. I also have in A5 um, an adjoint SO11. Again, I'm not yet using octonionic units, and so I can think of this as the um, diagonal matrix LL and minus 2L. I warned you that these capital Ls are like almost not there. And it was the fact that we didn't know about this matrix that held us up for a couple of decades. This is going to be turn out this matrix, which we call S sub L, will turn out to be like a really, really important part of the entire story that I'm going to tell this morning. Well, whatever time it is where you are. This matrix acts as a projection on spinners. So I also get in this A5, I get two spinner eights. And when I give you a number of dimensions here, it's always real. Two real eights of SO5-1. But the label split, not just U and L separately, but now I have U plus L labeled spinners and U minus L labeled spinners, and they split into two sets. As I go to bigger and bigger groups today, this S capital L, as I let the split label get larger and larger, this S capital L will still act as a, a projection. And I'm going to get, you know, capital I plus or minus capital I L um, projections as well. So all of the spinners split up into two sets because of, of this SL. Um, there is a, a natural killing form for E8. And this SL is a projection on those spinners. And so then the U plus L and the U minus L become these two sets. And these are, if you go back to like the work that Lisi did, um, there, there are 128 spinners in E8. You want 64 for one generation. And there are these two sets. Um, and so he wanted three generations. He had twice as, he had 128 spinners. And so he tried to put a lot of the third generation into the bosonic, um, into the bosonic space. We will try and argue that the U plus L and the U minus L projections, these pairs, are more like bras and kets. They're more like size and psi bars. In particular, you should not think of them as particles and antiparticles, um, but they're killing, uh, killing duels of each other. Okay, let me pause again. Are there any questions yet? The gender is not there, so. Tevin, can you see? 
Yeah, I'm monitoring the chat. All right, yeah. Does anyone have questions? No. Okay. All right, so what I said in terms of the game, I'm looking at this A5, and so now I want to look at the smaller groups that are inside it. So you can always do a decomposition of an orthogonal Lie algebra, SOP plus Q, into an SOP plus an SOQ plus a P by Q, and these are uh, tensors representations of both the SOP Lie algebra and the SOQ Lie algebra. And I'll make extensive use of this decomposition today. The beautiful thing about in the magic square is that when you decompose these things and you stay in the magic square, you're guaranteed that the spinners will decompose appropriately uh, into spinners of um, these smaller Lie algebras. And so we showed, or I, I claimed that there was an SO51 inside the A5 that we're looking at. And so what I wanna do is decompose that into an SO31, which is the Lorentz, space-time Lorentz uh, Lie algebra that I want. And then there's an extra SO2. And then there are uh, four by two reps, which are two Lorentz vectors and they're labeled by these SO2 labels. So the labels that I'm using for SO31, I need one boost-like label and three rotation-like labels. So I'm using L uh, for the boost and IJK for the rotations. Because I want to stay in the magic square, I need this L is part of C prime. I need the rest of C prime. So I also need the label U and the IJK are part of the quaternions, and so I also need the label one. So this tells me if I want Li, if I want a preferred quaternionic space for the three spatial directions, that I have to have a one label. And if I want a preferred split thing, I need a U label. So that tells me that the labels on this SO2 are U and one. All right, so there's the A5. Now what I want to do is extend this to E6. I'm just checking my time. E6, I'm moving from the quaternions to the octonions and still staying in the C prime row. So it's a particular signature of E6. It's E6 minus 26 that I'm gonna look at next. So I'm adding the labels in what I would call H perp, the, the things that are perpendicular to my, uh, the units that are perpendicular to my initial H. So I'm adding the labels IL, JL, KL, and L. The E6 is can be decomposed into the A5 that I've already talked about, and now I get to add another SU2 and then 40 things that are reps. The Lorentz structures that are inside the representations of A5 in this 40 is I have four more SO51 Lorentz vectors. And this SU2 goes together with the SU2 that's in A5 to make an SO4. So these four Lorentz vectors have labels in this SO4. They're labeled by these labels, L, I, L, J, L, K, L. I also get inside of E6 to double the number of spinners. So I had 16 spinner degrees of freedom. I have 16 more by including those spinners with labels in H perp. Because I've gone up to the octonionic case, I can no longer think about these three by three matrices as being lots of zeros and just a non-zero in the three, three component, these GSKs. And I have to use Rob's um, E8 magic to rewrite these 
in terms of Ds. So these are uh, double index Ds. Um, and so the, the GSK, when I rewrite it, it becomes D L dot K L minus D I L dot J L, for example. The other two elements in the SU2 are then written in this way. So this is the first example of how you have to be more careful about the, the your understanding of what the objects are once you go up to the octonionic cases. So these things that we used to know about are really these things. Now that I'm in E6, I have the old SU2, which was these three elements, and I have the new SU2 that's in E6 that wasn't in A5, and that's these three elements. And notice how when I take sums and differences of these, I can, in the usual way, get just um, single Ds that represent the um, the single rotations that are in SO4. Um, I will comment, you can't see it from this notation at all, but this new set, this new SU2 is in the G2 Lie algebra that's uh, that comes from the octonionic units. But what I really want you to see is that, let me go back a slide. These things that look, when I was thinking of them as elements of A5 and I could use this structure, they looked like they had quaternionic labels. But now I'm seeing that they really did have octonionic labels all along. So even in the A5, um, there, this is, is sort of the reflection of the octonionic structure um, that's, that you can't see until you go all the way to, to the octonionic case. Um, So now what I want to do is think about what the physics of this A5 and E6 is. So we have this E6. It's our first example of something with octonionic content. It's made of the two SU2s. One of them is in A5 and one of them is outside of A5. The new SU2 annihilates all of the old spinners, the ones that were in A5. Um, and this should be pretty obvious because these spinners are in A5 and this is the centralizer of A5. So it commutes with everything. When I say annihilates, I mean it commutes with. The, but what's not so obvious is that the old SU2 annihilates the new spinners that are in E6, but not in A5. And so this is giving us a chiral structure um, that distinguishes between the spinners that are in A5 and the spinners that are in E6, but not in A5. And this second vial handedness of these SO5-1 spinners emerges from the non-associativity of the multiplication of the octonionic labels. And so you see the handedness of physics emerging in a very natural way from this parameterization. So the SO5-1 that's in A5 has spinner eights. And these break up into two SO3-1 spinner fours, but how they break up depends on the choice of the carton that you made in the SU2. So let me go back a couple of slides. And so I can pick any one of these, these three elements to be the carton that I want to use. It will pair with a carton in the, um, in the new SU2. And so I can pick this carton, this carton, 
to give me weak. When I do that, that will take these SO518s and turn them into two SO314s, which I can then identify with electrons and neutrinos. But that how I choose the electrons versus the neutrinos depends on the choice of the carton in, in the, the two SU2s. So now I can talk about generations because there's a real arbitrariness in the choice of the cartons in the SU2s. Um, again, let me go back and, and look at this. There's like, why would I pick this one over this one or this one? So because these SU2s really depend on the octonionic structure, if I put this into my the Lie algebra that I care about into the physics, these two have to go along for the ride. And so I have three choices of which cartons um, I can pick. But it means that these SO5-1 spinner eights that I have that tell me like electrons versus neutrinos, there are three different ways of dividing those up into electrons and neutrinos. And so the question is whether there, the generation structure comes from those three ways that are actually sit on top of each other. And whether the generation mixing that we see both with neutrinos in neutrino mixing, which is like the modern exciting things, but also from something like the CKM matrix, whether that comes from the fact that these three generations are actually sitting on top of each other. So this is a, yes. A question. So when you say sitting on top of each other, what really does that mean? And how will I get different masses for the three generations? So we don't yet have a mechanism for um, breaking the symmetry between mm -hmm. the three generations and the masses. That's something that we're currently working on. Um, so we don't have, yeah, we just don't have that yet. But what I mean by sitting on top of each other is that you take these eight um, degrees of freedom and if you pick one of these cartons, then you say, these four are the neutrino and these four are the electron. But if you make a, the, a different choice of the carton for the different generation, then you take those same eight things and say, now, instead of these four being the neutrino and these four being the electron, then you take a different four to, to be the muon yeah, I guess. Is this a, some and, kind of a rotation? Is it some kind of a rotation in a plane? Is it three directions, 120 degrees apart? Is there some way of thinking like that? Uh, I think probably. Tevin, do you want to say more about that? Let me jump in. I just put a comment in the chat. Um, the point is that the SO5-1 spinner 8s break up into two SO3-1 spinner 4s but how they break up depends on the choice of carton elements. Mm -hmm. Fine, that's, so what I, that's what I said, but to gender ask whether they were, you would think of them as being 120 degrees apart from each other. Not the, that I'm aware. The, the three choices of carton. The point I'm trying to make is that it's a higher dimensional structure. It's not just a rotation in a three dimensional space. Okay. And the number three is unique. You'll have does necessarily yeah. have three generations. Yes, because the three is definitely unique because um, here are your three independent choices of carton. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you. I yeah. get it. Okay, um, I'm just checking my time. I want you to have. Know at least 20 more minutes here. Okay. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to understand is when you split the SO groups up, you get um, 
you get vector reps of the smaller SO groups. Um, so in particular, in E6, there are six space-time Lorentz vectors um, that, and two of them have complex structure labels and two of them have weak labels. And so one of the things we're really trying to understand is are this, these vectors with their weak labels associated with them, do they correspond to the photon and the Z and the Ws? Um, and so that's at this stage, just to, we're proposing that that's probably the case, but I don't know that we have a lot more to say about that right now. Um, we also, when you break these things up um, in E6, you have a full SO91. And so you have some, so the you have SO91 vectors. The SO31 parts of those vectors are, are space-time Lorentz things, but there are some other components that have um, weak labels. This isn't what I wanted to say. There are those vectors have some of them have some of the components have weak labels but some of them have complex structure labels. And so the question is the ones that have complex structure labels, um, but that are space-time Lorentz scalars, those look like they have the right mathematical structure to be the Higgs. And I can say more about that in the, in the question session if you want to actually list them out. Um, we also have um, the, in this E6, we now have spinners that, whose labels were in H, and we have another set of spinners whose labels are in H perp. And what we showed is that, what I, what I'm tried to show was that those have different weak handednesses um, depending on which carton you pick. And so to build a Dirac, those are vial spinners, to build a Dirac spinner, you have to take the sum of one from one space and one from the other space. Um, and so in this paper, we discuss a way in which you might do that that gives you a possible Dirac equation on those spinners and the particles and antiparticles are then determined as usual by the sign of the energy in that space. Um, I'm not entirely sure that the choice that we made in this paper is exactly the right one. That's a place where um, we're still actively working, but I would say that we have too many choices for possible Dirac equations. Um, and it's not that there aren't any, it's that there are too many and we're trying to figure out exactly which one we want. All right, so I wanna spend my last few minutes then doing the final extension from, we started out A5 in this position and then we went to E6 in this position. And now I'm gonna go all the way to, to E8. So I'm gonna go from C prime to O prime. When I do, was there a question? When I do that, again, I'm going to have to use the magic of um, replacing the SL thing, which I thought was thinking of as a matrix, which was LL minus 2L down the diagonal into something with double index Ds, um, but I can. And then I see that that S capital L um, really did, the, the double indices are things like D, uh, I comma I L, that they really did have an octonia, a split octonionic structure from the very beginning. I just wasn't seeing it because of the way I was writing the, the, the matrix. So now I have the new E8, I've got everything. So hopefully what I've shown you is that the E6 structure is just large enough to hold 
the whole weak sector. So all of the leptons and the SO31 and the complex structure and uh, um, both a, a SU2 right and an SU2 left. So E6 is, is the lepton sector and all of the weak, um, the weak symmetries. I'm going to get up to E8. What I get to do is add an SL3R because of my signature and representations that are 27 by three and, and a 27 bar by three bar. I'm adding these split labels, I plus and minus IL, J plus and minus JL, and K plus and minus KL. So all of the plus signs are say the three and all of the minus signs are say the three bar. And what I see is when I do this, that these 27s are literally a Jordan algebra times a null label. And so all of the work that was done decades ago by us and by other people that looked at how E6 acts on a Jordan algebra um, applies straightforwardly to this. And this was this was like super exciting to us because back in back in the old those olden days, the Jordan algebras we were making Hermitian things. And then the E6 acting on it, some of it was Hermitian and some of it was anti-Hermitian. But these labels allow everything to be anti-Hermitian. The split labels make the Jordan algebra anti-Hermitian. Um, and the E6 sticking in a capital L makes everything anti-Hermitian. And so all of that fits inside of E8 with both the uh, the things that are doing the acting and the things that they're acting on all being in the same space. But there, there's a sense in which you can ignore these labels and just use the work that we, we've done in terms of understanding this. But I would say that the work that, that, that I did, Tevin and I did in terms of trying to understand this E6 acting on a Jordan algebra we only saw that there was one of these <laughs> because we didn't see the six different labels on them. And because there was only one, we were trying to put leptons into the Jordan algebra rather than trying to put quarks and color into the Jordan algebra. And seeing all of these things fitting together inside of E8 tells you like, oh no, these are the, these are the colored things. Um, so the new work in the in the paper that we hope will come out within a couple of days, um, what Tevin has really done is shown that, um, well, what we knew in the past was that the determinant of a Jordan matrix was an E6 invariant and it was built from Freudenthal and Jordan products. What Tevin has shown now in the new paper is to show how to translate Freudenthal's uh, E7 work to build the Freudenthal and the Jordan products and the determinant all in terms of E8 commutators, um, actually commutators in, in E7 or E6, um, but, but within this E8 structure. And so um, as an example of that, it's possible to show that E7 is E6 plus two twenty sevens with the labels K plus KL and the K minus KL and an SO11. And if you take the something from this set and something from this set where the coefficients are related by the Freudenthal product, when you commute them, you get the determinant times this SO11. I think even more significant is that if you take the whole of E8, you have the 627s, and there's a way of thinking about doing double commutators uh, of the something one from each color that go together to make the to make this determinant. Um, 
So I think I want to talk about this slide first. So our again, our very early work showed how to take one of these Jordan Algebra 27s and divide it up into three what we called quaternionic one squares that satisfied a Dirac equation. So these were to divide it up into primitive item idempotents that turned out they had to be quaternionic. Um, so what I'm saying is that there is a way of thinking of these 27s as if they have non-zero determinant, then they have to have three primitive item potents in them. If, yeah, if the determinant is non-zero. And this recent work is showing that that's coming from things with three different colors all into a, the same set 27. So this, these 27 dimensional representations at E6 are really important mathematical objects. They have inside of them SO3 one vector, actually SO9 one vectors, but uh, so SO3 one vectors and SO3 one spinner pieces. And so they have what looks like both quarks and gluons and they have like fundamentally three colors in them, but they're, they're still 27s. They're indivisible sort of composite 27s. And so the question is whether these, the, whether these 27 things are actually things, are actually baryons like the proton and the neutron. And that if you try and interact with them, you can see inside them pieces that look like quarks and you can see inside them pieces that look like gluons, but you can't ever, it really still stays a 27. And is this really the, is this where quark confinement comes from? Is, is that you can't really break up that 27. Um, let me go back. No, I think I just, I think I've already said all of this. So all of these things are in the 27. Okay. Uh, I can have a few more minutes to gender? Yeah, sure, sure, definitely. Okay, so after Tevian's talk, there was a like a whole lot of conversation about um, this SL3R isn't really an SU3. And, and so I have some things to say about that that I think may help. Um, oh, before I get to that, I just want to comment about I think some people in the audience may be trying to use this SL3R to represent generation rather than color. So it, there's a threeness here. And so do you want three generations or do you want three colors? I want to argue that in the model that we're building, it's clear <coughs> for our model, it's clear that these really represent color. In particular, this thing S capital L the eigenvalues on the spinners in E6 are three times the eigenvalues of the spinners in the 27s. So this forms a natural hypercharge. This is the same hypercharge as comes from like an SO10 gut. Um, you know, we're, uh, this isn't a new result, but this is the SL hypercharge from an SO10 gut that really signals that you're talking about color. Um, there is a problem that in the signature that we have here, the eigenvalues of SL are real, but the eigenvalues of the two SU2s are pure imaginary. It's not uh, a compact SO10 gut. And we're still trying to figure out how much of a barrier that is. Um, but the S capital L is working, works really nicely if you use this split SL3R. Um, the question is, we do have a complex structure acting on spinners. Um, so do we want to complexify this SL3R? Um, we can complexify it when it's acting on the, on the spinner reps. But the eigenvalues of the SL3R are already real. The raising and lowering operators for SL3R are already in SL3R without needing any complex structure. And so I'm, I would probably argue that SL3R maybe is the structure 
that that people wanted for color all along. They just didn't realize it because of this permission versus anti-permission question. Um, so I think there are three possible resolutions to the discussion about um, I think what got us into trouble was Tevian made this really like bold claim that there are only six gluons in our model. And people were instead of eight and people were um, bothered by that. And there are three possible answers to that question. And so these bullet points are distinct from each other. One possible thing is to notice that the standard model, if you, if you look at the vertices in a Feynman diagram, those are Lorentz gammas, tensor Gelmonts. We have in E8, the, in SL3R, we have adjoint SL3R. There are eight things there. So these objects, the Lorentz gammas and the Gelmonts, they all exist in E8. So you can just like do standard model Feynman diagrams, but then if you do that, you have to do that in the enveloping algebra of E8. But there, but we can ha we have eight things, we have the eight Gelmonts. Um, another possibility is that you can use the complex structure that acts on the spinners in E8 to take the to complexify the SL3R. <laughs> but then again, you're acting, you're using the enveloping algebra rather than just E8 itself. So those are two possible answers. But the third answer, the one that Tevin was trying to talk about, is that in E8, you have Lorentz vectors that are a three and a three bar of color. And so the question is, whether these, because they're both, they're naturally both Lorentz vectors and colored, can these be the gluons? And so these were the six gluons that Tevin was talking about. And I think he and I personally lean toward the fact that we may want to alter the standard model to allow these objects to be gluons. But this would, this would be the one place where we really, well, the two places where we really have to vary from the standard model are here and in the overlapping generation structure. So I just wanted to show this picture. This is the hallway of our house. And all of these are the many, many whiteboards where we took these 248 things in E8 and we tried different ways of fitting the standard model into E8. And um, so once we decided to take the SO124 of the half split uh, octonionic uh, magic square seriously, that we wanted to see eight as E8 as an SO124 plus spinners, then, then you get to ask the question, um, like how, how do you fit everything in here? And the, ob so, but if you take this signature seriously, then the thing that you probably, the, the first thing that you would want to try and do would be to put in a compact SO10 gut. <laughs> um, and then you'd want to put in, and so once you do it sort of like a compact SO10 gut, then how do you put in Lorentz and what are the two things that are left? And that's what we tried. And I think that that's what David Chester was trying to talk about two weeks ago. What we've done here today is to take this SO12-4 and, and if you want to stay in the magic square, then you really have to break the 12-4 in this way, an SO2 rather than an SO11 for um, conformalization. 
an SO31, and then you end up with this SO73 instead of a, a compact SO10. Um, and from the point of view of the orthogonal algebras, this looks like a really strange choice. But what I want to sh share with you, so we can go back and, and talk about um, these two choices in the question session, but I just want to end with, if you break the E8 up in this strange way, then you get to start taking these other groups, A5, E6, E8, and E7, seriously in the way that I've said. And you see that the A5 gives chirality, right-handed leptons, and one of the SU2s. When you then go all the way up to E6, you get the left-handed lept, you get to add in the left-handed leptons and an SU2 and potentially some things that look like weak mediators. When you go to E8, you get to add the colored three plus three bar, bar Jordan 27s and possibly the ability to build those into quarks and baryons with potentially testable properties. And you get the E7 showing you how to, the E7 structure showing you how to build determinants of the 27 representations of E6 using that color in a natural way. Um, and these extra structures, I would argue that you, you can't get from putting, trying to put into the, into E8, put the standard model in with a different set of signatures. Um, you don't see the value of these if you complexify the whole of E8. Um, you don't see these structures if you are only looking at Clifford algebra structures. These are really three th things that are in the three by three nature of the E8. Um, so I think, you know, my feeling is that everybody who is a part of this lecture series is doing interesting things and seeing interesting structures and maybe seeing some things that we would like to see in, in this model. But, but I'm really, I think I want to argue that this is a model that lots of people should be looking at. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you very much. A really lovely, enjoyable talk. Uh, Great. Uh, so it's, we are open for uh, questions. Uh, maybe while I, we wait for hands to come up, I could start by asking you. So uh, maybe I'm not understanding you properly. Are you saying you can not have generations and color both? You have to make a choice. You don't have enough spinners. You only oh. have a hundred. You only have one hundred and twenty-eight spinners. Okay. So you don't have enough spinners to do three generations and three colors. What if I suggest, please go E8 cross E8? Uh, sure, then you have a lot more things, but then you have a lot more things. Yeah, um, but I, then I, I, I call them predictions. I call them stuff that we have not yet seen, but we should go look for. For example, I get a total of six fundamental forces instead of four. So I, mean, I call that a prediction and maybe to the uh, experiments can rule it out, but uh, it is not unaccounted for baggage. I can take care of them. And the Higgs, the Higgs is a composite. Well, I wanted to ask you in, in your work, you said you could, we could discuss the Higgs during the question answers. The Higgs will be a standard model fundamental scalar or it will come out as a composite? Okay, well, you said a whole bunch of things. Let me respond to them like, kind of one <laughs> by one. So, um, so I was really intrigued by uh, Neil Turok's talk um, a, a few weeks ago where he was saying that he was really trying to do a really minimalist thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say that we're making a choice to say 
let's just look at one e8 and see mm -hmm. whether or not we can get everything into that with without going to like e8 cross e8 let's mm -hmm. let's just let's just do one e8 okay. and then when you do that you i think you see the um You know, then then we start to see. Well, then you have to put the three generations on top of each other, and mm -hmm. that might have testable predictions. And then people can test it, and it either is that or it's not that. Mm -hmm. um, you could instead say, well, to get all three generations, you can say what you want to do to gender, which is I'll do E eight cross E eight, and then you have a bunch of you have like way more stuff that's mm -hmm. also testable. And so yeah. I think you know. I'm not claiming that this is the only theory that can work. Um, I think that a lot of things that a lot of people here are doing are are making interesting predictions. And so we can only tell them apart by ultimately by by making experiments. So sure, sure yeah. You know, so so fine. And the Higgs, the Higgs uh, would like to so comment the, on Higgs. So what I'm saying is that any age. We have some um, vector-like things that have both um, complex structure labels and weak labels, but are Lorentz scalars. Mm -hmm. And so those degrees of freedom look exactly like the Higgs. Not, okay. It's not a composite thing or anything. It's those degrees of freedom have, have have those structures. So I think we have a Higgs. Okay. I, and, I think we have the, the Higgs. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Thank you. And if we uh, try to account for the two forty-eight dimensions of E8, you have all that accounted for completely in terms of your particle content? No. So there are a few things that we haven't accounted for. We haven't accounted for the things that have the 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 um bosonic things that have color and weak labels mm -hmm. so so there are there are a few things we don't know what they are but okay. I, I would argue that those are precisely symmetry breaking things to get separate color and weak forces from some unified theory mm -hmm. That's uh, what I was uh, saying, Tavian, that I find that if you have E8 cross E8, uh, that facilitates symmetry breaking. Um, I, I would argue there's a difference between starting with something that big, mm -hmm. where you are absolutely, as you said, predicting new forces versus trying to fit the standard model or something close to it into as small a package as possible. Yes, yeah, sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Alessio has his hand up. Yeah. Alessio, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Corinne. Thanks very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I've got essentially two questions about gluons. Um, as far as I understood, uh, you were pointing out that maybe they are related to the three plus three bar, uh, but uh, essentially they should be in the adjoint of the gauge group. So essentially they, they should be in the adjoint of SL3R. Um, yeah. I, I didn't understand, I mean, exactly where you put gluons in this picture. So, so that's... The standard model says that they should be in the adjoint, I agree. And I'm saying maybe he, this is one place where I'm saying maybe the standard model is wrong. Okay. And yeah. so, so we, we can build some things. So let me go back to, um, so we can build some things that are, so these Gelmonds are in the, ad, we have the adjoint. So we have thing. So I think we can build things in the adjoint the same way the standard model does. But the standard model really said we're gonna 
we're going to do things we know from the weak sector where you have an SU2, where you can't tell the adjoint rep from the other reps. They just said, we're just going to like copy that philosophy over into the color sector. And so put they just put the adjoint in. And I'm questioning whether that or not, that's what they should have done in the standard model. Because uh, you will get a theory in which the gauge vectors are not in the adjoint of the gauge group. So you should reformulate uh, your quantum field theory in a non-standard way, right? Because the, yes. uh, so that's the point. And then, uh, okay, that's interesting. We have been talking by mail about this, but if you choose SL3R as the gauge symmetry, then uh, in some sense, you will have two different kinds of gluons. Uh, well, if you stick to gluons being in the in the adjoint, because of course you will have compact gluons in the sense that they correspond to compact generators and then non-compact ones. But I understand that uh, you are questioning this very point, so probably it's not uh, it's not a problem for. I mean, so, in... well, so you could you can you have six things. And you can think of them as three compact and three non-compact, or you can think of them as six null ones. We're picking the six null ones because those are the things that naturally make the these structures about the Freudenthal and Jordan products only work with this signature. And they only work with the null label. And so there's like how you put these things together into, into 27s that form natural determinants requires this signature. So, so there, there are other reasons why we really want to pick the SL3R, but then we're, we're in this land of, yes, but, but it's no labels, not three compact and three, three boost labels. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, yeah. Corinne. Thanks. Yeah. Let me jump in with a comment as well, if I may, uh, for Alessio, that um, questions about compact generators and even about gluons are trying to directly point to things in E8 to play the role of things in the standard model action. And I believe what Corinne is saying, what we are saying, is that the connection may still be there, but be a little more subtle than that. Right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Uh, uh, David Jackson, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks to Jen Dan. Thanks very much, uh, Corinne, for the talk. Um, I think um, this might be a little bit similar or related to, to Jinder's question, but, um, just a thought of this, my, my background is in particle physics experiments, but um, so, I mean, the gauge forces and the gauge particles are very different to leptons and quarks, and so the gauge um, particles are associated with symmetry actions, like say the actors and the leptons and quarks are the actees things acted on. I'm wondering if you thought of your um, sticking with your adjoint action, but putting the Lorentz and gauge symmetries in one E8 during the acting and leaving the 248 represent representation space just for the um, electrons and quarks, so there'll be plenty of room for like eight gluons, the full SU3, and in principle more room for three generations. I was just wondering if you thought about using the adjoint, this same adjoint representation, but having the um, the gauge and the rent forces in one E8, and electrons and quarks in the other, um, the, the kind of actees in the representation space, rather than everything in one E8. Um, yes, we've thought about it. <laughs> All right. And um, it's I, I think I feel like the, that's not where the mathematics is leading us. So the, mm. the, the, the I, I feel really strongly about this. The, the mathematics is telling us that this two by two structure and being bosonic things and then the three by three structure being fermionic things. Um, that was actually a structure we use for doing, trying to build the super string. Um, Right. That 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 you know you have the SO9 one. So so 
I was kind of leaning in that direction anyway, because that's how I came into the, to the theory. But when you take that seriously, then the, I, I, I don't really know how to say this any better is that you end up with not enough in the, in the EA, the actees, you still don't have things that are all fermionic. The, um, I, I, mm, maybe the way I want to say it is that triality, triality is like governing everything that's going on here. And the tri oh. triality really tells you that for in an SO, in an SO8, you have one vector and two different spinner representations. And that's underlying the whole, all the type structure that I'm talking about. And so, you know, if you do E8 cross E8, first of all, you've got like way too many things, um, way more than you need, but also they aren't of the right type. Right. And, it's, and it's really easy to put to to not recognize that. Right. If I could have a, a short follow up question, which is related, I mean, you both, uh, you and Tijinda both mentioned you maybe you get these extra things, predictions. I'm just curious, do you ever keep an eye for things that might be a dark matter candidate, that sort of thing, or dark energy or the dark sector in general? Or is it just purely um, standard model first, first and foremost? Well, so my philosophy is try and get everything into E8 and we do have a few leftover things and oh. you know so could those be dark matter or I you know right I, I don't I don't know but um I feel most comfortable trying to put the things that we have experiments about and we right. know about right. and then see what's left um and so I'm still working on the trying to put in the things we know about and so I haven't really gone too far into this dark matter thing. I think other people really are, you know, so I think Rob, for instance, is uh, is likes to look for dark matter or, you know, is 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 really making a very different set of choices. And um and I think that what's exciting about this lecture series is that as people make different choices, they're seeing they're seeing different possibilities and different things. And as we share what it is we're each seeing in in the set of choices that we're making, um, I I think uh, we can inform each other from those things. So I'm not saying to anybody, don't don't make the choice you're making. Um, I certainly don't have, there's nothing that I've said today that's a no-go theorem for what anybody else is thinking about. Um, but what I am saying is, that when you look at these A5 and E6 and E7 structures within E8, that you see mathematical possibilities and physics possibilities that maybe people who are taking different approaches aren't gonna see. Um, and, and those I think need to become a part of the conversation. Right. Yeah. Thanks. That's very helpful. Yes. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, David, could I? I would like to respond to the important point you made and also add to what Gordon is saying. So it's true that E8 cross E8 gives a lot of extra degrees of freedom, but we are able to argue that those go into making the Higgs composite. We have a second beyond standard model Higgs. We have two Higgs doublets, both of which are composite. And so that is in some sense a prediction. If LHC uh, for, for does not find that the Higgs has a substructure, then I am wrong. On the other hand, we are predicting that the LHC should find that the Higgs is a composite and not a fundamental scalar. And the other uh, comment, which you, a good point you raised, I mean, what do, uh, this theory, if it is fundamental, should I, I address the, every question like, you know, baryon asymmetry, and in particular, dark matter. So in this latter front, we find something which we are quite excited about. We don't have any plausible dark matter candidate. We have three fermion generations, and we are saying that all those fermions have already been found. And we don't have the axion, the strong CP problem, 
is solved without having an axion. But amongst the two new forces we predict, one looks very much like what Milgram's MOND is, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. And uh, this is uh, what he called dark electromagnetism. It's a U1 gauge symmetry, which is a counterpart of U1 electromagnetism. And the quantum of charge here is square root of mass. Interestingly, in Milgram's uh, uh, modified dynamics also, the acceleration is proportional to square root of mass, not to mass. So we are looking into that out of one out of the two new forces is likely MOND. That is our prediction. There is no dark matter. The other six force is more subtle. It's a SU3 gravity that we call something like a strong gravity analog of QCD, but which might have a very weak coupling, which is why we probably don't uh, uh, see it. Yeah, so I thought uh, I'll take this opportunity to answer, answer what you raised. And I would now request David Chester to please come online. David Chester has many comments. We want to hear you, David. Hey, sure. Thanks for the, the lovely talk, by the way. I appreciate it. Um, so it, let, let me actually just ask a question to start. So are you looking for a model that has all of the off-shell degrees of freedom described by 248 um, degrees of freedom? Is that sort of the goal here? Because I just noticed that you seem to uh, latch onto the vector representations of that Lorentz group. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I can hear you. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm understanding your question enough to be able to answer it. Um, okay. okay, so uh, like typically the standard model has 12 gauge bosons, but then there's also vector representations. So there's 48 off-shell degrees of freedom there. Are you trying to get something as close to those 48 degrees of freedom or something similar? And then for you know the fermions as well, potentially to fit inside the the 248 or yes. not because yeah yeah because you did point out that the the space time manifold is kind of different than the the gauge group structure so I I, I didn't know which one so, you were leaning towards. Well, I think we want the gauge group structure to include Lorentz. Right. And but, do you see that as a Lorentz gauge symmetry, or is this part of the global manifold somehow? I'm not sure. It's a symmetry. I don't know that it's a gauge symmetry in the sense that the field, the, the other three forces are quantum fields. So Right, because you I can mean, so, uh, gauge the Lorentz group to get Einstein-Carton theory, which is basically general relativity. Yes. So it... We we I think what I'm trying to say is we haven't yet addressed gauging anything. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and so what we how many things should be gauged? This is totally totally just algebra. So how how many things should be gauged? I don't I don't know. I'm just trying to understand the algebra. Um, and so should you gauge Lorentz and get gravity? I it's not something I know enough about to be able to say. Um, did that answer your question? Let, let me come, sure. come. I think I think it's agreeing with what you just said. But if I'm understanding, David, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, you have the gauge bosons in the standard model, which are Lorentz vectors. And we expect things that are Lorentz vectors to show up somewhere in that um two by two part of E8, yes. And I think that was your question. Yes. I see, right, right. Thanks, yeah, so I, yeah, that was something that I understood from this talk. I missed this in the past, right? There are some vector representations. Um, so one of the comments I just mentioned in the chat is that there, there's a possibility that you could have um, gut Higgs fields that are also just happen to be vector fields. Um, so that was just one of the comments that I made in the comments that Tejan Bear wanted me to state. So yeah, yeah, just something to keep in mind, the idea that the, the the manifold could be separate from the gauge theoretic structure. But I mean, I think it's also interesting because if you actually isolate the Lorentz group 
the maximal compute commuting uh, group would be uh, spin nine comma three, and then you would get exactly twelve vector representations. Um, but it's I, I didn't figure out how to get the twelve gauge bosons of the standard model from that in any way. But just something to keep in mind. It's curious how there does seem to be twelve vectors in E. Yes. So there are 12 vectors in E8, and we've been trying to identify them, but they're in the way in which I broke the, the model that I was presenting today. When you break them, they're, those, those vectors are tensored with, two of them are tensored with a complex structure, four of them are tensored with weak labels, and six of them are tensored with colored labels. And so it's not the eight and four, but it's two and four and six. And it's so like trying, so we're trying really hard to understand what those things could be. Um, and so the, the point is that the four really seem to line up nicely with the, the photon and the, and the weak mediators. And but once you interpret that, then you really want to interpret these these three plus three bar ones as as gluons, and then you have you have a a three and a three bar gluon space rather than an adjoint uh, an adjoint SU three set of gluons, and then we have these two that have com that are tensored with the complex number labels, and so like are those those the the because those those that's the, the only set of vectors that are complex is like are those polarization vectors are they the higgs are they you know do you have a vector higgs or is just the scalar part of it the higgs um and but then interpreting those things takes us a little bit out of the land of the standard model and adjacent to it, but not quite it. And I don't know that we know enough particle physics to really be able to figure that out. And that, that's that's where we're stuck in wanting help. Great, you. great. Um, I do have some, I mean, while I'm talking to David, we've spent some time after your talk um, two weeks ago, trying to like map what you were talking about into what we were saying, and I have some comments about it. Are you interested? Yeah, yes, definitely. Please. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. So, um, so that was. Are my slides still showing? Yes. 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 Okay. So first of all, there's just a a comment about um, complexification complexification versus conformalization because I think you tried to conformalize. So um, so when you're conformalizing, you have an SO3 plus one and a one plus one that you break up into SO3 one and an SO1 one. And these, and these four things that have the, you know, have these two labels in them. So these are, if you try and put a Clifford algebra structure onto this, um, the, the compelling thing about conformalizing is that this SO11 squares to plus one. And so you really want that to act like the gamma five. And so you have the degree two things in your Clifford algebra from the SO, the adjoint SO31. And this is I times the degree four. And then these two, um, vector reps act like the degree one and I times degree three things in the Clifford algebra. Um, it turns out that this only works, this this sort of cliff, it looks like you, then, then do you want to complexify this Clifford algebra or not is the big question, is one big question. Um, but this, it turns out that this own this structure only works sort of representation by representation on the spinners in E8. It doesn't work globally. 
when you do complex, same thing when you do complexification, but now you've got your pull, you're take, taking an SO3 plus two comma one to the SO3 one and an SO2. And then you get like, you get things that look like degree one and two and three and four without any eyes in it. So you can do either of those things in your E8. But what we, yeah, but what we saw you do, I think, is that you took the SO12-4 and you said, I think you said, take the three boost-like labels to be the, 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 to give you SO3 for the Lorentz. And so those are the labels ILJLKL. And then you, so out of the SO12-4, you took three of the four to be, to be rotations in the three-dimensional real space. And then you had one more boost label. And so it was natural for you to do uh, conformalization to use up that fourth boost like label and well, then i can comment that um we actually have both but not in the gauge symmetry so um you could either uh yeah we did consider the complex structure but we in in six dimensions but we looked at um d equals three plus three rather than five plus one but it's basically the same thing and what, what i found really interesting is that um spin four comma four which comes from the split octonians contains both uh, three complex structures, but also three conformal groups. And so you can get both that way. Um, but yeah, it turns out that I'm not interested in gauging spin four comma four. Um, so yeah, I did think about this for a while because you could, when you go to spin three comma three, then that would be SL four R and that, that maps even better to Clifford algebra uh, for like CL four. Um, and you could use that for metric affine gauge gravity, uh, or you could consider conformal gauge gravity. And so for the gauge symmetry, I ended up going down the conformal route, but there's still, when, once you go back to E8, um, you know, you still have that spin four comma four symmetry and uh, you, you can still get, yeah. So that, that was just how I looked at it that way. But yeah, 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 that was a pretty good summary. So, Can I say more? Yeah, please, of course. Yeah. Um, you did, I think, a lot of different things, David. So it was like, I'm trying to only like sort out one version <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and so, I mean, I really saw you like, um, where's the picture? But I saw you like doing this, <laughs> the same thing of like trying all the different ways of fitting things in. But there are two ways in which I think your, what you were doing violates the game that I was trying to play, which is not to say it's not a legitimate thing to do. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a different game. So I felt like you were trying to put the, all the gauge groups in. Um, so in your SO12-4, you wanted all the gauge stuff to be compact. So once you take 10 dimensions out to be compact out of the 12-4, it leaves you a 2-4. And so if you want to put in Lorentz, then you have to put it, you have to put it into the boost-like things and conformalize. And if you do that, it doesn't sit inside a magic square. That, that you have to choose, we, we tried this, you have to choose between having all of the gauge symmetries be compact and being able to, to put things inside the magic square, or you have to do something like complexify or go to E8 cross E8 or do something bigger. But if you're right. really trying to do it inside, the, if you're really trying to sit inside the real E8, 
then, then you have to have that choice that your subgroups are in the magic square or you can have a compact SO10. Well, the, the magic square does certainly provide a lot of subalgebras of E8, but um, we attempted to classify all possible subalgebras in the real forms of E8. So we looked at every possible branching that comes from the real forms of E8, whereas the magic square will only give you a subset of those. And so if you just focus on the magic square, I agree, it will be hard to find all of the paths. Yeah, so so Tevin had a graduate student, Aaron Wongberg, who I think did did this. And unfortunately, I it was in my slide set and I deleted it right at the end, but his his diagram of you know all, all of the, the subgroups. That was a very um, nice paper. I remember the the E6, right? Yeah. 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 That was very yeah, nice. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I've also seen that diagram. Very nice. The student was he was here today. For your talk. I think he's left. Yeah, now. he had to leave. He had to leave and go teach, but he came to the yeah. beginning. Was he was, was Aaron here? Good. Okay. He was here. He was here. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, because I had the the previews of my slides up, I couldn't see who was here. Um. So but... uh, on a similar note, Corin, in your some along the talk, you mentioned the Dirac equation. In yeah. how many? Space-time dimensions is this Dirac equation? Three plus one. Uh, not 10, because in your earlier work, in your E6, E6 is the, or I think, the symmetry group of the Dirac equation in 10 space-time dimensions, if I remember right. Yes, you are correct. We're now interpreting the extra dimensions, if you will, as corresponding to things like weak degrees of freedom. Yeah, then no, that's good. That I would definitely agree with. Uh, it's like Kalusa Klein in some sense, no? But your Dirac equation is not in the higher dimensional space time, is it? I, I think I would answer we can do it either way. <laughs> yeah. In the sense that once you include the generalized momentum as P going to P plus EA, where A is your vector potential. Yeah. And if you are thinking those as along extra dimensions, you're probably going to higher dimensions once you include the weak interaction, say. I think maybe, in fact, what we're looking for here is, is SO5 one, where that's you interpret- good, That's good too. That's good. Where, where you interpret two extra dimensions as masses. Yes. Um, because that that it's the it's the A five structure, and the Dirac equation really wants your uh your Dirac spinners to be quaternionic. Yes. And so I think it's it's an it's an A five structure, not a not an E six structure. In our early work, we were looking at E six. And SO five one is good enough for quarks also? No. Only only leptons. So the quarks are the quarks. I mean the twenty sevens in the Jordan algebras have an have an SO nine one vector in them. Yes. But the primitive idempotents mm -hmm. have to be have to be quaternionic. Mm -hmm. So I th so I think if if the twenty seven is really something like like a baryon is a proton, then the quarks inside. May may well still be SO five one structures. That I would agree. That I would agree. Yes, the the composite quark state. If you want to understand quark confinement, the composite state would be SO five one. That's what you are saying, no? Yes. Yeah. And what what do you make of this six dimensional space time? The two extra are for weak. Sorry, what's it, which six dimensional space time? SO51. The SO51, the two extra degrees of freedom are actually, um, for us, have complex structure labels, mm -hmm. not, weak la not weak labels. And so then those are, I think, masses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. But 
but then there are also the the things with complex number labels and weak labels are the are the extra things that make an SO91 vector, those are the Higgs. And so you see sort of like the Higgs and the masses on the vector pieces as, as being part of the same mathematical structure. Mm -hmm. It's uh, these, like, the, these extra pieces, like they move around depending on which, which algebra you're looking at. Um, yes. Yeah, I get the feeling that we are all in similar ballparks and there is some truth in here. We are not yet able to converge on an agreement amongst those of us who are looking at E8 that yes, this is, this is it that we all agree on. And I was hoping maybe if we continue the series next year, we try to get more focused and use this meeting as an opportunity to, you know, like a workshop where mm -hmm. we make some progress instead of go fall apart, the year ends, the talks go away. And then we again, uh, I think, uh, yeah, David, go ahead, uh, please say it out. Uh, just a random comment. I did see some three by three matrix get used for some mass mechanism in uh, the supersymmetric flipped gut theory, excuse me, mm. in that theory from 1987. Um, yeah, it's just kind of curious, but actually the the, the scalars that they added from their, um, their super potential is out, actually outside of E8 for me, but maybe that'll be, maybe someone else will see something that I missed yeah. on how to use that for the, because you guys are a little bit more focused on the magic squares with the three by three structure. So you might find a little more utility than I was able to. Yeah, so David, I wanna go back to your comment about, you know, the, the three, the magic square is forcing us to look at only particular algebras. And- right. I, I think I would comment is, you know, with all those whiteboards in the hallways, we looked at a lot of things that were not in the magic square. And it wasn't until we put this restriction on ourselves that we, that, you know, we were just wandering around with too many choices. And when we put these restrictions on ourselves, we started to be able to see like exactly where we could agree with the standard model and where we differed from it and and how the differences are actually quite small and mostly in the color sector where you, there's less experimental evidence um so yeah i mean it, i think if you keep wandering around in the space of where you allow yourself all of those subgroups you may see some things that we're not seeing um but it's also like, will you see the compellingness of putting this, that, that, hmm. that when you put, yeah. it, you know, what, what Neil, what Neil Turok was saying is that when you put restrictions on yourself in some particular way, it asks, it forces you to ask, can I resolve this problem rather than just to reject this model? Yeah, so I was trying to just restrict our study to all possible paths that lead to uh, the Lorentz group with the standard model gauge group. And typically, if you study a gauge theory, you would take SU3, and that SU3 structure doesn't, you know, typically you add in the, the space-time degrees of freedom outside. But um, when you study gauge gravity, uh, such as Ivanov and Niederle, 1981 that, that like in the first paragraph of that paper they clearly state how it's actually beneficial to put all of the matter in the scalar sector quote unquote with respect to the global manifold so that your your gauge bosons are the only ones on spin one and so once you do it that way your goal isn't to get the off-shell degrees of freedom of the vector gauge bosons in e8 but you want the higgs and the fermions to have all of their off-shell degrees of freedom with the E8. And when you look at it that way, then you can just realize that 
I mean, yeah, I was just kind of curious that there was three different, there was only three ways to get to the conformal group with SC5. Yeah. And SC5 does lead to the standard model. So yeah, it's just, um, yeah, I, I guess I was just more focused on trying to get the standard model. Yeah. And that, that's why, you know, I, I think we need different people making different choices. Yeah, I now see how you, you actually are going for what I was calling a, a, a strong version of Casey's dream, which I couldn't accomplish. So you, you, your, your goal is more ambitious than what I was <laughs> Maybe, because yeah. it's difficult. I mean, it's just fundamentally difficult to get the gauge boson degrees of freedom from a single algebra. I mean, no one's ever done that. So it's it's a pretty bizarre, yeah, like from the physics we currently have, it, it seems like it's very difficult to do that. Yes. The only thing I can think of that might, yeah, I don't know. I shouldn't have said that, no, I'm just kidding. No, I think, you know, I, th I mean, I think we've said all along that, you know, I'm really committed to to this, to pursuing this point of view to the bitter end. Um, but it is ambitious. And, you know, either the problem with doing any of these models is like either they're right or they're wrong. <laughs> and like, there isn't there isn't any between in this. So, um yeah. Um, but what's fun right now for me is that a lot of the work that I did 30 years ago is coming back into play and things where we we thought we were really stuck have, have come unstuck. Um, yes. And, yes. And so un understanding the Jordan algebras now is is what we're really trying to do because exactly because we're taking the SL3R seriously. But it was that, you know, I, I mean, let me, I can even show you sort of like, let me find. So one of these is, you know, is that decades ago, we were, when we were looking at E6 acting on, you know, Hermitian Jordan algebras, we were in this uh, place in the magic square. We were in C prime tensor O, but we didn't know it. And, but the only, part of the split division algebras that we needed to understand this entry in the magic square was having capital L. And so we didn't have the capital L that I said is almost not there. And we didn't have the S capital L and that that does the does the splitting of the spinners into two sets. And there were all kinds of things that we didn't see because we didn't know that we really needed this capital L in the game. And once, and, and you know, Tevin went ahead and started like putting the capital L in the game because he was looking at trying to make more and more of the magic square. And I was just like, it wasn't helping me. And I was just like really resistant. So there was maybe a decade there where he was working with his students, like, because he was seeing this structure there where where I was just I was off doing education research and like doing my day job and just saying like no because why would you just like bother to put this if you're just staying in this row why would you bother to put in this L it just seemed to make things like so nasty and now yeah exactly you know, and now we see like, oh no, it's part of this bigger structure and S capital L really has these labels in it and now, now we get like all kinds of things are working out that that we didn't see back then. Yeah, similarly, uh, like Faza Gersi had the, the F four from the associator, so then people tried to extend that to E six, um, but technically, you need some complex or split complex structure, but you can play some games without it. 
and make it seem like you're getting somewhere, but then it gets harder to generalize further. Yeah. <laughs> unless you put in those units. And and so I think, you know, like the I think one thing I would share with anybody who's working with E8 is that this language is like super helpful to mm -hmm. to, yes. to to help you see where to keep track of where all the pieces are. That when you when you're working in abstract algebra land, it, it's easy to see like this piece of the elephant and that piece of the elephant and that piece of the elephant, but not see how they fit together. And picking a basis and 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 being able to like say, okay, I'm gonna assign these basis elements to this, then you see which other basis elements you don't have, but like lots of different pieces, and it allows you to see it really coherently. Um, so yeah. I recommend I recommend this notation, even mm -hmm. if you're you're trying to put the physics in differently, mm -hmm. making different choices about the physics. Yeah. yeah, this is there in your papers, right? Yes. Not, yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, from the papers, the one with Rob's name first is is the one that really describes um, how to how to do that. E to do E8 in that language. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Any more questions, please? So we are reaching the two hour mark. So maybe we should consider winding up, Corinne, anything more? No, I'm good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a great lecture. Great to have it as a part of the recording. And so we'll meet two weeks from now for Anthony Lazenby's lecture, 27th October, on geometric algebra and its relation to octonions and the standard model. I think that will be another fascinating new perspective. Okay, thank so, you. great. So, thank you all. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there's thanks from the participants. And uh, so, I will log out now. Is that okay? So good night or good day, all of you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.